All right, here we go. It's winter 2021. It is Tuesday. It is week six. It's CVPP. Off we go. Anatomy of the heart. Now, I'm not going to do the anatomy. I should spend a whole lecture reviewing your anatomy key stuff here. So you are now on your own. So if you're really shaky on the heart, I mean, I'm going to go over it super quick. Uh, but if you don't know what the fibrous skeleton is, and the valves and the chordae tendinae and things like that, you should go watch this video. You can get to the video by going to YouTube and just searching for Professor Doug's lecture page heart anatomy review. And there is what will pop up. <coughs> and yep. So I'm going to assume, and if you don't, you're going to be lost in these lectures if you don't know what the superior and inferior vena cava is. The atria, and I'm constantly talking about the right and left atria, the ventricles, tricuspid, mycus, <coughs> my, mitral valve. Sorry, got that morning frog in my throat. Uh, aortic and pulmonic valves, pulmonary trunk. Let's. I'm going to go over that and make sure you know the blood flow. But let's just go over this. And yeah. This is all I'm going to do, though. So, superior vena cava is here. <clears throat> inferior vena cava is down here. Remember, it dumps into the right atrium. Remember, there are no valves here. This is a straight shot. Uh, this is really important, this fossa ovalis right here. So, remember that is the foramen ovale in the, in the fetus, in the unborn. And yep, so the blood comes in here into the its returns. This is venous deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium. You have an atrial systole that contracts and I mean, there's passive filling of the right ventricle, but there's an atrial systole that dumps blood into the right ventricle as well. The right ventricle contracts the, at the same time the left one does, but we'll stay on the right side. It ejects blood through the pulmonic valves. This is not called the right semilunar valve ever. It's called the pulmonic valve or the pulmonary valve. goes through the pulmonary trunk and it splits and goes down these two, a right and left pulmonary artery, heading into the lung. Even though they're called arteries, that's deoxygenated blood. All right, there goes into the lungs. Like, I don't know, here's a lung. Goes into the lungs, gets oxygenated, and now it comes back into these pulmonary veins, two pulmonary veins, jumps into the left atrium. And remember these atrium, especially on the right side, they're stretchy. They can stretch out, which is an important concept when we talk about cardiac tamponade. Blood then passively drains into the left ventricle, and then atrial systole occurs and tops off the ventricle and fills it completely. Ventricular systole occurs, and very important valve right here. This is called the aortic valve. Never call that the left semilunar valve. It's the only time you use the word semilunar valves is when you're talking about both of these <coughs> collectively, so to speak. Then blood is shot up here, right during systole. Uh, this is the ascending aorta. This will be the aortic arch from here to here. Descending aorta starts right here. Sometimes they call that the infundibulum. For now, we'll just call it the descending aorta, and you know the rest of the story. So you need to know that like the back of your hand, or you're going to be lost. So let's get to now. That was your anatomy review. And now let's get to this fossa ovalis thing, because that's really clinically important to the heart. It's a very thin structure, the fossa ovalis. It's, it has a valve and a limbus. The valve is so thin, it's only one layer. 
It's formed by the first embryologic layer to lay down, which is called septum primum. The wall between the atria and the ventricles, or between the right and left atria, and the wall between the right and left ventricles, <coughs> it's made of two layers. Uh, but this fossil volus is mainly made of one layer, which makes it vulnerable to holes. So remember back in the embryology days, uh, it was the foraminal volley, and blood shot through it because oxygenated blood was coming in through the superior or inferior vena cava was filled with mostly mom's, really all of mom's oxygenated blood. And that shot into the right atrium, mixing with a little deoxygenated blood coming back from the superior vena cava. Uh, but that really highly oxygenated blood was shot right through a hole called the foraminal volley or the oval foramen. Um, and yeah, because your lungs really don't work, right, when you're a fetus. But once you're born, that closes. And it pressure closes at first and then permanently is welded shut by fibrosis at one year of age. So here is the fetal heart circulation. So inferior vena cava, you would have, we'll make it, uh, how about red? Very oxygenated blood. Oops. <coughs> uh, we have oxygenated blood. Let's see. So it would become in the, we could have put the, let's put the inferior vena cava over here. How about? So inferior vena cava has oxygenated blood in the fetus. And so this oxygenated blood comes flying in here. There's a little valve we'll look at called the eustachian valve that guides this blood in. And there's a hole here called foraminal volley. And this blood goes right through the hole into the left atrium. So here's the left atrium over here. And this is just a drawing, right? The left atrium would be behind this. They just pulled it out here so you could see it. But, yeah, that's how we get oxygenated blood ready to go in the left heart here because the blood coming back from the lungs, there's blood returning from the lungs, is blue. It doesn't have oxygen because the lungs don't work. Right? So all this great oxygenated blood. And if you miss some of the... Because some of the oxygenated blood, you're going to lose it. It's going to go through the right ventricle, and it's going to get shot out during ventricular systole through the pulmonic valve here, uh, and you're going to you're going to send some of this to the lungs, which is a good thing because the lungs are tissue; they need some oxygen. Uh, but there's another hole right here called the ductus arteriosus. So here's another way that you can get some of that oxygenated blood in the left side of the heart here and in the the aorta because this blood is ejected during atrial systole into here, and then during ventricular systole out it goes here. So that's two ways to get blood. And then, of course, this closes the minute the baby's born, because now, now real oxygenated blood is coming from the lungs. All right, you know that. Can't help but do a little anatomy. All right, so this is an important view. This is the right lateral side of the heart and what they've done is they've cut away the wall and kind of peeled this back and now you can see all the parts so this is this is a tricuspid valve or cuspid tricuspid valve here here's another one up here um, so this is all atrial properly here's the oracle right here and we have some parts that there's the eustachian valve that I told you about. That's a guide to help blood come through the eustachian valve, and it, it forces the blood into the foramen ovale. But now this is the fossa ovalis because this is an afterbirth heart. And so normally this is sealed, and we'll look at that more here in a second. Uh, that's important. This is the tendon of Tordaro here, and if you follow the eustachian valve and the tendon of Tordaro up, to a spot where it meets, it comes very close to the cusps of the tricuspid valve. That's where your AV node lives. That's a node would be right up in here, this region. 
And so there's two parts of the fossa ovalis that are important. We have this skinny one layer thick. This was old septum primum. This is called the valve of fossa ovalis. And then we have a kind of a lip here. This is the second tissue that, that migrated down during embryological times because the second layer migrated down, the uh, uh, septum secundum migrated down to thicken this wall between the atria. But for whatever reason, it left a hole here and it didn't. It didn't go all the way down. So it formed a lip here and that's called the valve, the valve of, of fossil valus. So, or I'm sorry, it's called the limbus. The green is limbus. Uh, the V is for valve. And so normally, during the, fir during the first year of life, these fibrose together. They weld together. And about 75% of you, that's the situation. And you can't open this up. If you stick a catheter in here and push on this, you can't get into the left ventricle, left ventricle, or left atrium. Left atrium is right behind this, this wall here, but you can't get in. 25% of you, if you got a catheter in here and pushed on this, you could push your catheter right through. All right, so everything I said, about 75% of humans, uh, you get a welding of that valve together. The limbus and the valve weld together. I should say. And so what happens if you don't? 25% of you, some, some of you in the class have, don't have a welded valve and limbus. So um, that's actually got a word for it. You have a probe patent for amino uh, And that could be a problem only if you develop pulmonary hypertension. All right. So here's, we already talked about that. That's going to weld right there. Yep, weldy. And same deal here. We're going to weld this right here. It's where this fibrosis together. And then this is the left atrium right here. Super high pressure. That's an important point, right? Lower pressure over here in the right atria. That's an important concept. So how does it initially close right after birth? Well, back to that concept I just drew. Because, where's this picture? Uh, right after birth, because these pipes are now, lungs are working and, and dumping blood through, a lot of big volume of blood through here, pressure is much higher. Like it's 50 millimeters of mercury, we'll say here. It's only 5 millimeters of mercury over here. So, so in the 25% of you who have this, what's called a propate foramen ovale, or just a foramen ovale, there's no problem because the pressure pushes the valve, or pushes the limbus against the valve, and your pressure closed. Okay, so that's a very important concept. All right, and that... I mean, even after birth, everybody is pressure closed af after birth, right? And it takes about a year to weld those two together. But, but by the age of one, most of you are welded, and so you don't ever have to worry. But yeah, so Peyton Framen Ovalli is the star of the show here. So 25% of you, as I said, it doesn't weld together. So you have a situation called a propate foramen ovale. There's definitely people listening to this video who have no idea, no clue that they have a propate foramen ovale. And it comes from kind of medical terminology where, or even it started in a in cadaver lab where the students noticed that they could push a probe right through the fossil ovalis in some people and not in others. And uh, soon they figured out, oh, some of them never fibrose together like you're supposed to here. So there's a propate foramen ovale. Well, so what? Uh, well, in many punk people, uh, it, or in, in people with a normal functioning cardiovascular system and who have healthy lungs and don't have the key is pul uh, pulmonary hypertension, 
doesn't matter. You don't even know. You do, there's uh, there's no problem with that uh, you, because your pressure sealed. So you're not going to leak any blood. Okay. So as we said before, uh, as long as you have high pressure here, just like between birth and one years of age, you'll just keep doing that for your whole life. And this is pressure sealed. You're not going to leak leak any blood between these two chambers, which is not good when you start leaking blood between the two chambers. But, here's the big but. What if someone, that 25% who, heaven forbid, what if you develop pulmonary hypertension when you get older? Maybe you get COPD and you wreck your lungs. Maybe you have heart failure. Maybe you have aortic stenosis. And you can't push blood through the lungs very easy anymore and the pressure builds. Then you have a problem because the pressure... If you have pulmonary hypertension, you're going to increase the pressure in your right atrium and in your right ventricle as well. And eventually, once the pressure gets too high and is higher than the left atrial pressure, you're going to pop that valve open and now you've got a problem. Because, and we're going to talk about this a lot, you're going to, you have what's called a pathological right to left shunt. Specifically, in this case, you have a pathological right to left atrial shunt where the deoxygenated blood in the right atria, right atrium, singular, is going through the hole, through the patent foramen ovale, and it's poisoning your good oxygenated blood. Well, it's not poisoning it, but it is it was mixing deoxygenated blood with oxygenated blood, and your body absolutely hates that. Okay, here's the cartoon. So in this cartoon, because they have pulmonary hypertension, <coughs> the pressure is backed up all the way from the pulmonary trunk. Pressure's gotten really high in the right ventricle, and now it's super high in the right atrium and it's much higher than the left and so because pressure goes from high pressure to low pressure and because you're not welded that foramen ovale might as well be a foramen ovale now but the propate foramen ovale pops open and you get a pathological right this is the right side <coughs> pathological right to left shunting of blood and you can see our beautiful red oxygenated blood is now tainted with deoxygenated blood the body absolutely hates it it doesn't mind losing oxygenated blood into deoxygenated blood that's not as big of a deal at first anyway but it hates the opposite scenario it hates having its good oxygenated blood mixed with deoxygenated blood Got it? All right, so what's pulmonary hypertension? I think we talked about that before, but what's the deal with that? Uh, well, that means that the, the microcirculation in the lungs has very high pressure, and it's made it difficult to, for the right heart to push blood through the lungs, and therefore the pressure builds up. It, could, it doesn't have to be the lungs either. We'll look at the causes in a second. But it could be a beaver dam anywhere downstream or in the lungs. But anywhere downstream really from the right atria. Even if there's a beaver dam, let's say, in the tricuspid valve, that can still increase the pressure in the right atria. Anything that increases in the pressure in the right atria is going to cause this shunting, this pathological right to left shunt. I mean, it, it, so it could, it could. Yeah, I mean, it could be the, pulm, the pulmonary valve. You could have a tumor. I'm just going to go downstream and uh, through the pipes. You could have a tumor in your pulmonary trunk uh, and acting as a beaver dam. That's going to raise the pressure upstream. What's upstream of the pulmonary trunk? Well, think of your anatomy. Go backwards. The right ventricle pressure will rise then the right atrium pressure will rise. I mean, it'll even rise 
could rise all the way down to the feet, could back up that far if the pressure if the beaver dam is significant enough. <coughs> so what are the causes of pulmonary hypertension? I think we've done this before, but lots of beaver dams, any beaver dam downstream from the lungs. What's downstream from the lungs? Well, the only thing really downstream from the lungs is the heart. So heart failure will act as a beaver dam. Mitral valve stenosis or regurgitant disease acts as a beaver dam. Aortic valve stenosis or beaver dam acts as a beaver dam. That's going to back blood up all the way into the heart, all the way into the right side of the heart. Or, I'm sorry, all the way into the lungs and then all the way into the right side of the heart. Uh, then a beaver dam in the lungs themselves, COPD, chronic bronchitis, or emphysema are the two subcategories of COPD, so they can do it. They do do it. It's common. Uh, pulmonary embolism. Maybe you got a good-sized embolism st stuck in one of the pulmonary arteries. Beaver dam. That's going to increase the pressure of your heart. If you have a PFO, propate and foraminovale, you're going to not feel good because... Your good oxygenated blood is being tainted with deoxygenated blood. The congenital heart diseases, well, that's what we're talking about now. That's so an ACD or a VSD. We're going to be talking about atrial septal defect and ventricular septal defect. And um, again, even the tricuspid or pulmonic stenosis. So any beaver dam downstream from the right atria can cause this pathological right to left shunt. Um, now this, I, I mean, this shouldn't really be in here, these two, just looking at this. Because we're, the question is, what causes pulmonary hypertension? <clears throat> so these, these would cause the right to left shunt, but they're too far away from the lungs. So slide 26, which is the day of my birth. I should be able to remember that. Uh, these technically don't do that. These can cause a right-to-left shunt, though. But these can't cause pulmonary hypertension, so I'm going to make a note of that before I post these slides. So what's the danger of a left-to-right shunt? Sorry about that, still fighting this, this whatever, this voice thing. What's the dangers of a left to, uh, of right to left shunt in a patient with a PFO or any hole in ASD or VSD? Any hole in the intraatrial septum or intraventricular septum? What's the danger? It's hypoxia. It is not having enough oxygen going through your system. Uh, and your tissue, including important tissue like your brain, your kidneys, your liver, they start dying. So that's not a good thing. And that's called generalized hypoxia. Uh, what's, what else is dangerous about this hole in a patient with pulmonary hypertension? It has to be with hypertension. Because then you're going to get the right to left shunt, right? That's where this comes from shunting of deoxygenated blood into oxygenated blood. You, there's something called a paradoxical emboli, which we'll talk about here in a second. That's another danger. My father-in-law actually had a stroke from a paradoxical embolism. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, because the, the, lamp, the flow of blood through a PFO in someone with, with pulmonary hypertension is not laminar, Bacteria can get stuck on that in that region, and you could develop an endocarditis, an infection of the heart, increases the chances of that as well. Interestingly, migraine headaches are associated with PFOs, especially in people with pulmonary hypertension. They're thought to be maybe mini strokes from little small paradoxical emboli getting up into the brain. Uh, right heart failure. Um, so this is more of a danger of the pulmonary hypertension, but you will uh, wreck your heart, right? Your heart is trying to pump blood 
to properly perfuse the tissue, but it's in part due to the PFO as well. So your right heart is trying hard to properly perfuse the tissue, and it can't. It's not designed for that, and so you get right heart failure. And kidney failure, I could have elicited liver failure, and that's from the hypoxia. Uh, generalized hypoxia, again, the body does not like deoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood. And this results in a general circulation hypoxia. And that causes a decreased oxygenation of all body tissues. More specifically, you should say it causes decreased tissue perfusion is the buzzword. Uh, perfusion is the amount of oxygen in the tissue. And patients will develop clinically the classic signs of hypoxia. What are the classic signs of hypoxia? Well, these are medical murders. I mean, you see somebody in your office and this they don't they haven't noticed this and they got to go to the ER to get checked out. That something serious is going on. Uh, the lips, the gums, the the tongue, uh, the nail beds think they'll get blue because there's not enough hemoglobin, there's not enough oxygen being carried on the red blood cells, and you literally start start turning blue, and that's a very bad sign. That's past the pyloric stage. They might look a little pale, pale white at first, but as things get worse, they turn blue. <coughs> um, some other signs, uh, well, if you're not getting enough perfusion of your tissue, the heart is going to try to fix that by pumping harder and speeding up. So you get tachycardia, uh, tachypnea. If the heart goes faster, the lungs will go faster. I could have added that in there. Um, and you barely have enough oxygen in your tissue to survive. If you try to walk upstairs or exercise, uh, you'll become you'll have trouble breathing. You'll breathe very, very fast. That's called exertional dyspnea. So exertion is walking up the stairs causes breathing so rapidly it's like you just ran a hundred yard dash when you didn't you just walked upstairs uh, if you don't have enough oxygen to the brain you're going to start getting dizzy and maybe you faint syncope is fainting presyncope is just about fainting if you don't have enough brain or blood to the brain you get confusion and you can't remember who the president is can't remember what day it is or what month it is or where you are and you have no energy because you don't have oxygen. Headache is common in these people. Don't know the mechanism of that. Probably from tissue ischemia. If it gets bad, you can die. You can go into coma uh, because of brain cell death. What is what a blood What's the blood work look like in patients with this chronic hypoxia? Well, the chronic hypoxia, besides all the other things we talked about. It stimulates the bone marrow. Specifically, it stimulates something called erythropoiesis, which is the process of making red blood cells. And yeah, so the body says, well, if we're not getting, if we're not carrying enough oxygen, getting enough oxygen, what if we make more carriers of oxygen? And that's its thinking. And it, it helps too. So it makes more red blood cells. Same thing that happens when you go up at altitude, you go up to Vail, 8,000 feet. <clears throat> and you make more red blood cells. So your blood gets a little thicker too, but that's, in this case, this would be called secondary erythropoiesis because we know the cause of the erythropoiesis. Uh, and the cause is because our we had enough red blood cells, but they're getting, the deoxygenated blood is getting mixed in with the oxygen, oxygenated blood. So we're basically losing oxygenated blood by that mixing. So this, so what's the fix? Make more red blood cells. But now you have too many red blood cells, and that causes problems. So that causes your hematocrit to rise, and hematocrit is a measure of the kind of the thickness or the viscosity of your blood, specifically the number of r extra red blood cells. <clears throat> when you have too many red blood cells, and your hematocrit is raised, you have a condition called polycythemia. 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 Make sure you know that. And you'll have a class on this, so I'm not going to go into the weeds on this, but if you take someone's blood and you put it in a tube and you spin it, you centrifuge it down, 
the heavier stuff moves to the bottom. Uh, the formed elements move to the bottom. You have a plasma up here at the top. And the red blood cells are at the very bottom because they're the heaviest. And then you have this little buffy, weird little coat here called the buffy coat, which is made up of mainly white blood cells and platelets. But in someone with poly, uh, polycythemia, you can see that this thick region is much, much higher because they have way more blood cells. Someone with anemia is just the opposite. They don't have many normal red blood cells. Okay, more squalae of a right to left shunt. So what's the deal with this paradoxical embolism? How did my father-in-law get struck down by this thing? He's okay, but it's just a small one. He didn't have much residual damage from it, but certainly a big scare. Did he take the doctor's advice and close the hole in his heart? No, he did not. Doesn't, I don't think they understand it, even though I tried to explain it. He's at risk for it happening again. He's on blood thinners, though. <clears throat> All right, so what's the deal with this thing? Um, so people with this right-to-left shunting of blood in a PFO patient or any, pa any patient with a hole, an atrial septal defect is a hole in the intraatrial septum. A ventricular septal defect is a hole in the, intervent, uh, in the interventricular septum. So you have blood flowing, but if it flows from right to left, or if you have a PFO like we're talking about, anytime you have a hole in the, the wall between the two chambers, either the atria or the ventricles, if you happen to get a deep vein thrombosis, you went on a long airplane ride and you got a blood clot in your deep veins of your extremity, and that blood clot, I mean, it should be called a thrombus, piece of thrombus broke loose and is now flying toward the lungs, which is the ultimate destination. But now you have this weird blood flowing from right to left. It's possible that this embolism could unusually jump from the right side of your heart to the left side of your heart, and that is extremely dangerous. These atrial embolisms are these these arterial side embolisms are extremely dangerous uh, because those pipes go to some very critical tissues. But that's a paradoxical embolism when a blood clot breaks loose in your low extremity, it travels up uh, through the inferior vena cava, comes into the atrium, the right atrium. Normally, it would end up in the lungs, but it sees this hole and it sees blood flowing between the right atrium and left atrium, and it travels into the left atrium, and now it's in the arterial side. And that's incredibly dangerous. All right, so here's the, here is the uh, story. There's the person got a blood clot in the foot, and it went up, and it came in right here. We'll make this the kind of the ostium to the inferior vena cava. So the blood clot went under here, came through here, and it goes, oh, look, we've got blood flowing here. Let's follow the flow. And it gets into here. Now this is an arterial embolism. Very, very, very dangerous. Because think of the places it can go. When it goes out up the ascending aorta, it can, maybe it can go into the coronary artery if it's the right size. One of the left coronary artery, right coronary artery gets stuck and you have a massive heart attack and die. Uh, maybe it goes in the left carotid, common carotid artery. And then it goes into the left internal carotid artery. And it goes into the circle of Willis and gets stuck and you have a massive stroke and die. You see, it can go into some really, really bad places. In fact, here are the places that it does tend to go into the coronary arteries, it causes a myocardial infarction, into the cerebral arteries of the circle of Willis, through the internal carotid artery, usually. Could go through the vertebral artery, too, but it have to be a smaller one. That'll give you a stroke. Uh, it could go in the splenic artery, <coughs> and um, that should be the celiac artery, right? That's my dragon. That's the cilia up the celiac trunk, right? And that splits up into a splenic artery and a common hepatic artery and a gastric, uh, that would be a left gastric artery. But it could get into the celiac trunk and knock everything out 
cause the beaver dam, and there goes your liver, stomach, and spleen. That would be really bad. Could go in your renal artery. And you could tell I just made these slides last night. I actually completely redid this lecture because we had so much overlap in it. Uh, renal artery, uh, well, it could cause a kidney infarct. You could lose a kidney. What if it's, it doesn't completely block the flow of blood? I asked this in the midterm, the lab lecture, and a lot of you missed this question. I was surprised. If it causes a decrease of blood flow to the kidney, what happens? Well, you get a, you get a hypertension, right? The R2A system turns on, and you get a hypertension. Um, or it goes in the splanchnic arteries, and you get an infarct of the intestine and a small bowel obstruction. So, the, again, these arterial embolisms are very, very dangerous. All right, cryptogenic stroke is interesting. So, when somebody is taken to the yard ER has stroke-like symptoms, and yep, they've had a stroke. Surprisingly, a lot of them are found, they can't find the reason. They do a CT, they do an MRI, they do an angiography, and they can't find the reason. Uh, these patients are called Crypto, this type of a stroke is called a cryptogenic stroke when you can't find the reason for the stroke. Come to find out, about 50% of people who have this cryptogenic stroke, they actually are found to have a patent for amino volley. So this is interesting. So the theory is that some small blood clots are passing through the patent for amino volley. And the scary thing is, we're getting a little too into the weeds, so I won't say this. It's not a Rubens or Robbins, but some people who don't have high pressure, they have normal pressures in their atria. So the, the patent for amino volley is pressure sealed. Some of these people are getting cryptogenic strokes. So it's possible that blood clots can pass into the into the arterial circulation through a PFO, even if your pressures are normal. Some of the theories would be, would be just incredibly bad luck. Let's say you had a blood clot break loose from your lower extremity, and it traveled up and up and up, and you just happen to be sitting on the toilet and pushing down your constipated at the same time the blood clot was passing through. Well, if you do a Valsalvis maneuver, the pressure in the right ventricle could go up to match that of the left ventricle, and it might encourage a momentarily right-to-left shunt. It's kind of the theory behind that, but uh, so don't worry about that, though. I think that's pretty rare, but there is emerging evidence on that. I'm going to keep my eye on that. Um, yeah, so the recommendation is for people who have had a cryptogenic stroke, an, at least an ultrasound should be done. And there's a test with microbubbles you can do, a harmless test, to see if you have a PFO where they pressurize the, the right atria and see if they can get bubbles to pass into that side. <coughs> but they recommend being checked for patent for amino volley. And that should be surgically closed to prevent that from happening again. Uh, let's see. Pulmonary hypertension versus the heart. The right heart, yeah, we said this already. The right heart tries to push through the pulmonary hypertension to properly perfuse the body, and you get heart failure. The right heart's not designed to for that kind of load. And here's a 65-year-old smoker with a history of PFO and COPD. They came in with chest pain, and you took a simple chest film because they had chest pain, and here's what you found. So heart is enlarged, and it's rolled when you see a bump right here, this is not the aortic knob, which is kind of pushed behind the vertebrae here, uh, but that is that is right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, have you guys had that soft tissue pathology yet? So that's right vent when the bump is here. When the heart when the heart looks fine, but it has a big bump down here, that's left ventricular hypertrophy. So the heart is kind of rolled over. What about other? Yeah, there's even more findings of a left-to-right shunt. So in the clinic, if you are auscultating, you'll hear what's called a holosystolic murmur. Holosystolic murmur. So that's a, a whooshing sound that 
it because normally you have let me explain it you have a lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub that's how your heart goes so you might have a and that's systole lub is systole dub is diastole systole diastole systole diastole so normally you can have systolic murmurs that go whoosh 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 dub whoosh dub whoosh dub in a holosystolic murmur you hear whoosh 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 you don't hear the dub at all it's just a really in other words it's a long murmur a long whooshing that's a holosystolic murmur that ain't a great thing now that indicates a left to right shunt okay and those are best auscultated uh, with the be or with the diaphragm it's not a brewery uh, so the left lower sternal border kind of the uh, remember the all pigs eat too much kind of herbs point the fourth and fifth intercostal space is technically the left lower sternal border so that's where you would auscultate and observe you might even be able to put your fingers the tips of your fingers in there to palpate the parasternal region the fourth and the fifth inter intercostal space put your fingers you might be able to feel a cat purring like a purring sound you know when you pet a cat and you feel it purring <coughs> Those are called thrills. And we'll hit this in lab again, but auscultory turbulent blood flow are bruies, but palpatory turbulent blood flow are not called bruies. They're called thrills. All right, and some blood work. You might see some, some secondary erythrocytosis. All right, some more clinical features. <laughs> if it's bad, you might even see a visible. You might not. You can hear. You can. You can hear the holosystolic murmur, the thrill, or the bruy. You can palpate the thrill in the left lower ster sternal border. If it's really bad, you might not have to do any of those things. You can just look with your eyeballs in the left lower sternal border, and you can see it bulging. Uh, in rhythm with systole uh, and that's not good those are called heaves or thrusts so a left lower sternal lower parasternal heave or thrust not a good thing that's really a, a significant right to left shunt so probably a these are probably ventricular septal defects that would cause that but could be an ASD a big ASD <coughs> could be a uh, usually not with a PFO though it's not the hole's usually not that big. Another phenomenon of hypoxia, and we haven't got Eisenmenger syndrome. I'm going to get the Eisenmenger syndrome in a bit. So I kind of put that in. We'll just let that hang there for a minute. There's something called clubbing, another phenomenon of generalized hypoxia. It's a sequelae, a sequela of generalized hypoxia. It's called clubbing. And no, it's not the back in my day the 70 clubbing was always fun back in the day uh, it's a different type of clubbing so here's clubbing and here's even cyanosis you can look at the nail beds and they're blue it's a great place to check for hypoxia uh, so this is a patient who is having not great body perfusion a patient with a I think he had a ventricular septal defect but he may have had a patent foramen valley with a left right shot any right to left shunt it's going to cause hypoxia. So this is clubbing. You get your nails start to accumulate tissue in the nail beds underneath, and it starts ballooning out the fingers because of all this extra tissue. And the pathophysiology of this is argued. It's not understood. It's constantly changing. <coughs> the current thinking is, but there's a problem with this thinking. Well, I'll show you in a minute. But the current thinking is that the uh, the cyanosis the chronic cyanosis stimulates and the cyanosis is going to be worse the farther away you go from the heart the worse the lack of perfusion is so all the way in your toes and fingers is going to be the worst so uh, the cyanosis and lack of perfusion of the fingers and toes stimulates the release of growth factors from the cells in the region and those growth, growth factors do what growth factors do. They cause a scar tissue, and they call proliferation of cells. And you get a thickening there, and that's the theory. The problem is 
people with Crohn's disease, they don't get hypoxia. That has nothing to do with your respiratory system. Yet, people with Crohn's disease can also get clubbing. So we're, mix, we're missing something. They just don't have that figured out yet. And I've seen a handful of students over the years who have had clubbing. And it's all, they have to get checked. If you have clubbing, you have to get checked. And they've all been just one of the idiopathic causes. But 80% of the time, it's caused by some respiratory disease. And the one you always worry about is cancer, especially if they're a smoker. So someone has clubbing and they're a smoker, they have to get, they need to get their lungs checked out. Probably a CT to look for tumors. Start with an x-ray. Soft tissue film. If that's negative, they're going to end up having a CT anyway. Uh, cystic fibrosis. Bronchiectasis can also do the trick. A lung abscess. So that's a, a treatable condition at least. Uh, a pyothorax or a pleural empyema. So that's another type of infection of the pleural cavity. Interstitial fibrosis. That's, some of these are treatable and they'll go away. So 80% of the time, something wrong with the lungs. 13% of the time, other conditions come in. And one of the biggest ones uh, is some of the... Um, actually, one of the biggest ones is right here. In fact, the guy who discovered this clubbing phenomenon had run-ins with, with bacterial endocarditis, which we talked about. Uh, and again, that has nothing to do with any type of hypoxia. And he was a physician. He noticed every time he had chest pain and ended up having bacterial endocarditis, his fingers got big. And then they'd treat it with antibiotics and it'd get better and the fingers would get small. And he could always tell when it was coming back because the fingers got big. Uh, so some of the other causes, uh, this, well, definitely the, the uh, PFO with patient with pulmonary hypertension, uh, a advanced case of ASD, or VSD, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and uh, tetralogy of Fallot, patent ductus arteriosus. In other words, these are all the cyanotic heart diseases because they all cause the Eisenmenger syndrome and they ultimately result in a right to left, a pathological right to left shunting of blood. Liver cirrhosis can show it, can do it. Chronic diarrhea, infected, infective endocarditis which is often caused from bacterial endocarditis, Crohn's disease. And then 7%, and luckily all the students that have caught this, just probably five, four or five of them, if I remember, um, they've all been fine, at least for now. And it can be idiopathic and not mean anything, So, but you do need to get it checked. And this is several students look just like that. They didn't have hypoxia, but they had their fingers poked out. Right? There is a way to tell. We're good, we can all do an experiment right now. So you can read about it. Let's just do it. So take, the back, take your fingers, put them in this position, put your distal phalanges or distal phalanxes, put them back to back like this. And I'm doing mine right now looking against my computer screen. I have a nice little diamond shaped window uh, right above the nails here. You should have that. If you don't have a diamond window, you got clubbing going on. right? There should be a diamond window. That's called Shamroth's sign if that diamond window is collapsed, and that could be early clubbing. And you can even, you can, in other ways, you can get a little tiny goniometer here, and you can measure the angle. And uh, it shouldn't be, I mean, I can look at my fingers, and it's not straight across. Mine's probably 140 degrees or so. And, yeah, that's another way to do it. Uh, let's see. So migraine headaches, we're still talking about this right-to-left shunt in someone with a PFO. They are associated with chronic migraine headaches as well, especially the migraine that has an aura. And some, there, there is not great research, but there are research papers that show people with debilitating migraine headaches a couple times a month, sometimes a couple times a week. They've closed PFOs, and they've and the migraines have went away. Um, so some papers have not shown this, so it's still a little controversial. Um, but that means these people with these migraines could be getting little tiny, little tiny embolisms, probably from the deep veins, 
going into the crossing over paradoxical becoming a paradoxical embolism and causing little tiny mini strokes and that's what these cried and mind rings were in these patients fun facts so this is confusing a PFO is not by our board book authors Robbins and Rubens it's not considered a congenital heart defect because everybody has a PFO when you're born right just by the age of one, most of you, 75% of you, don't have one anymore because you've fused, you've welded yours together. You've fibrosed your valve and your limb, limbus together. Right? So therefore, it's more, most authors consider it an acquired heart defect and not one of the congenital cyanotic heart defects. It can be diagnosed, as we said, by injecting micro bubbles into the venous circulation and then pressurizing the right atrium to the point the pressure is higher than the left and seeing if those bubbles shoot over to the uh, right the left side of the heart if they do you got yourself a pfo and they're the tiny little bubbles they're not going to cause any trouble in the brain or anything all right so that's that's enough with the patent foramen ovale or the pro patent foramen ovale let's talk about another hole in the interatrial septum and that's these are called the atrial septal defects and there's a bunch of them we're just going to talk in general about them uh, so this is a member of the congenital heart disease family aka the cyanotic heart disease family why they call these cyanotic because they often lead to a pathological right to left shunting of blood and hypoxia they're congenital because you're born with this hole. And the other members of the cyanotic heart disease, again, are the atrial septal defects, which is this one, ventricular septal defects, VSD, patent ductus arteriosus, and then the tetralogy of fallot. And we'll talk about those. All right, so what is an ASD? It's just a hole. It's a congenital hole, usually in the valve, uh, of the uh, usually of the valve of, of the fossa ovalis and when you're born you're not immediately born with a right to left shunt right because when you're born we know that the pressure is higher in the left atria compared to the right atria so if this was a PFO we're talking about it would be pressure cold, closed but it's not a valve type thing there's nothing to close it's a hole and so the babies who are born will have a shunting of blood from the left atria to the right atria and as I said the body tolerates pretty well the losing of oxygenated blood it doesn't tolerate the mixing or the poisoning of oxygenated blood so the little baby does pretty good until he starts playing and doing things that require more oxygen and then he can't get the oxygen because he is losing some of the oxygenated blood but the key is at first it will be a left to right shunting of blood but if this goes on and it's not fixed we are putting an awful lot of extra blood into the lungs and that's the problem right because the blood in the left side of the heart doesn't go to the lungs that goes to the body so now you're bombing the lungs with way too much blood and that is not good that's going to damage the microcirculation I guess I should turn the page here that's going to damage the microcirculation and start to make it scarred and once you damage the microcirculation of the lungs, it's starting to get very hard to push blood through the lungs. Pressure is going to rise and rise and rise. Pretty soon, pressure is going to be higher in the right atrium compared to the left atrium. And the blood flow is no longer going to be left to right because blood always goes from high pressure to low pressure. So you're going to develop that innocent left to right shunt is going to turn into a pathological did I say that right that innocent left to right shunt yeah I did 
is going to go into a pathological right-to-left shunt with the passage of time. The bigger the hole, the quicker this switching of the guard occurs. And this phenomenon of a left-to-right shunt becoming a right-to-left shunt, a pathological right-to-left shunt with the hypoxia and the, all those sequelae we talked about, that has a name. That's called Eisenmenger syndrome. Right? Eisenmenger syndrome. Here's the here's that same view that we looked at with the white right wall of the heart removed and we can see the fossil volus. So these are all the possible locations of, of atrial septal defects. The the ostium segundum defect we'll talk about next time occurs in the valve. That's by far the most common. But it, it could, these defects could occur right through the, uh, the thicker part of the intraatrial septum as well. All right, so here's how the baby is born. It starts out with, uh, be, there's no valve to close. So the day one, right when the baby wakes up, starts crying, and is alive, they have a shunting of blood. But it's not a pathological shunting of blood yet. They're just losing blood from the left atrium to the right. So that's called a non-pathological left to right. But the problem is all this blood is bombing the lungs and that's where the problem comes in. Some more fun facts about atrial septal defects. It's the most common. I always ask this question. It's the most common congenital heart defect found. There's the key word. Found in adults or diagnosed in adults. Not in kids though. How come in adults? Why don't why don't one year olds who have this problem show up? Well it takes time for this Eisenmenger syndrome to occur. You're not going to diagnose this until you have a pathological shunting of blood. You might get lucky and do an ultrasound and see it. I mean, you might pick it up by auscultory exam, catch it early, but usually you don't. And you need to wait for the symptoms of hypoxia to show up. So still, why does it take so long? Why does it take you know, 20 years to show up? Because the, the defects, the atrial septal defects, are usually little tiny holes. And you don't get much blood loss. And it can take 20 years for you to start having lung damage to the point you have pulmonary hypertension. Once you shift, once Eisenmenger syndrome occurs and you get a pathological right-to-left shift, then you're going to show up, but that can take 20 years. And... Oh, that slide's out of place, isn't it? So this is just what I said, because the atrial pressure is low and the holes are usually small, so only a little bit of blood gets over, and it it this it takes a long time. Everything I said already. Um, so if you push extra blood through the right heart, damage to the microcirculation. Here's where Eisenmenger is going to come in, and induces lung scar tissue formation. But it can take it could take 20 years to occur. So what? Now the damage. Everything I said. Damaged lungs are going to act like a beaver dam. The right heart's going to push hard. That's going to cause pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension is going to finally cause a reverse shunt. And you're going to get, once you get the pathological right to left shunt, uh, now you have cyanosis and its sequelae. And there's just a cartoon showing the left to right shunt. i got to fix these slides. Did these late last night. So this reverse shunting phenomenon has a name. Uh, and that is called Eisenmenger syndrome, as we said. Let me go hit some of those fun facts, though. Where were those? Yeah, so what's the, how often does this happen? Um, it's about 0.1%. The incidence is about 1%. The prevalence is higher, but we don't know for sure. because some, Sometimes these go away. They can close with the passage of time. And people can walk around with these their whole lives and not even know it. We think it's probably over 1-2% of the population. 
Um, there are genetic mutations, so if mom and dad have had one of these, you're at chance for one of these as well. Females are more affected, 3 to 1, compared to males. And of the congenital, if you're going to get a congenital heart disease, one uh, congenital heart disease, this is pretty big, about 33% of the pie is this type. Okay, talked about Heisenberger syndrome. Um, now we said this already too. Why no hypoxia from a left to right shunt? The body tolerates that good. We're not exactly sure why that is. But the body tolerates losing oxygenated blood. It does not tolerate deoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood. Said that because that, that's going to cause hypoxia. So the sequelae of Eisenmenger syndrome, well, we've already discussed everything. That's the same discussion of cyanosis. Eisenmenger syndrome, that's nothing more than a right-to-left shunt, and you're going to have all those symptoms of cyanosis. Okay, here's someone who died, and you can see they had all sorts of defects. We can see the valve of uh, and we can see the limbus of the fossil volus. Uh, now at death, there's no pressure, so we can see they had a propate and volley just kind of plopped open. Why did that plop open? Because it's not pressure sealed from the other side. There's no pressure in the heart now. And then we can see we have atroceptive defects everywhere. There's one here. There's one there. There's one here. So all sorts of ASDs in a PFO. All right, that's enough. Sorry for the choppy slides, but they were just made late last night, and we'll straighten them out with the passage of time. See you later.